welcome. Thanks for joining us today. We wanted to talk about a couple of things that are going on in the city during this special period. But first, how are you doing and how's your family? We are well, Lauren Glenn. We started out this whole episode with a, a little bit of colds and we're really glad that that is over and everybody's healthy. And I think that's our first question to everybody we, we talk to. So how are you, Lauren Glenn? We're good. You know, I have a college child um, and she's home from college and you have a child that's about to go. How is this interfering with her plans for choosing a college? Well, I think in some ways we were really lucky because um, she uh, she applied early decision in the fall. So her decision was made. She knew where she was going. And then she she technically she'll graduate in June, but she finished all of her requirements in December. Um, though she still has an online gym requirement. I don't know what that means. Uh, <laughs> and perhaps it'll prevent her from graduating, but we, we think we're pretty good. So um, as, the, as the city councilor for the southern part, one of the southern districts of the city, tell us your perspective on the city's response to this environmental and health emergency. I am proud of our community's response. You know, the directives we get um, changes day to day, the problems, um, uh, just everything has to be done with the best judgment that you have today. And we really have a team of people working to solve problems, keep their wits about them, um, and just get through this. And I'm really proud of the city team and how they're pulling together and how people are stepping up. You know, people are being asked to do things that are way outside of the range of what they usually do. And our, our city workers are really stepping up and saying, you know, okay, I, I'm not that familiar, but I will figure that out. And they're taking the ball, they're running with it. And can you describe a couple of innovative problem solving examples? Because I know people are thinking very creatively, very quickly, solving problems that sometimes we couldn't for years, we haven't been able to solve, but during this period, it's just getting done. Are there any examples of that that come to mind in the city? Um, I'm not the best one thinking about these things on the fly, but I think generally the resource center is really uh, taking a, a group of people that have all been working on different things and just putting them on the, you know, people are calling in with different issues and every, every day they're trying to resolve the issues that arise. And those are different issues, you know, in a lot of cases, you're saying, you know, some, some of these things are problems that we've always had. Maybe you're thinking, you know, things like um, the homeless, um, finding them housing and using North Beach. You know, we were able to get trailers for homeless people because we don't want to aggregate people in shelters to the extent possible. We want people to isolate. And um, it's one of the problems that we have in, in our nursing homes and elder care facilities. People are aggregated and that is going to be a problem with this disease. So for people that we can, um, uh, you know, short term, we can solve this problem this way. I don't know that it's really a long term solution, but it's definitely a good solution for this moment. So you're part of the Lyric Theater effort to create masks. We need masks. It's a big crisis. Tell us about that project. Yeah, so this was a, a project, I came into it, the city um, was working with Lyric Theater on getting masks made, and the city had procured the, uh, the resources, that first of all, they had um, worked with some other experts in hospitals outside of Vermont on, you know, what's the best mask to use, and I don't know, you know, you could you could work all day and all night every day. And the, the true answer to that question, you may never have, but this is um, a mask that is being, uh, it's being tested um, and uh, worked on by the chief medical officer at the Leahy Clinic is the one who has come up with the designs for this mask. 
Um, and so we worked with them to, uh, to, to come up with the de designs, the specs, and then we had to source the materials. And um, so we have done that. Then Lyric uh, has a large facility where they make costumes and they can cut all of this fabric. So they are cutting all the fabric, making the kits, and then they have volunteers who are making the masks from the kits that they're cutting. We also have another group of volunteers from the Milton Artists Guild. And so they're taking uh, large numbers of kits from Lyric, bringing them up to Milton and developing their own volunteer source up there. And then all of these masks get laundered by Gadju's dry cleaners um, so that we know that the masks that we're delivering are are clean and and ready to go for for a facility also i should say uh, we were able to procure a lot of these materials through rags to riches who gave us deep discounts on everything uh that that we need and we will as we work through we just got the first 60 masks to today and so those have been distributed to a few places we're going to have them use them and make sure that that's working. They are being used in um, hospitals in Massachusetts. Um, they are put on patients there, I understand. So then we're going to get some feedback on how everything's working. Um, and eventually we, we hope to scale up the, once we're sure that we've got everything right, then we can scale up production. And we are looking for more volunteers. I will say, that some people have had problems. The fabric we're using is a very, um, it's, a, it's a very stiff denim and that's hard for some sewing machines. So some people have had trouble getting their sewing machine to work with this dem denim, but there are a lot of people who in their homes have like industrial type sewing machines and are serious um, sewers. And those are the people we really need to help make these masks. How many are you hoping to make? How much material have you procured or planned to? We have enough fabric. Well, in theory, we have enough fabric to make 20,000 masks. We'll probably have a little bit of loss. You know, that assumes that, uh, you know, where you would, we're using home sewers, you're supposed to get 15 masks out of each yard. Um, some people will only get 12. <laughs> so there'll be some loss there, but we have enough fabric to make 20,000 masks. And how, what's the math on that? How many volunteers are you hoping for and how long would it take? We haven't done all of the math yet. We're getting as many volunteers as we can um, and we're then distributing them. I've been reaching out to um, residential facilities um, and you know, finding out how many masks that they want. And then when I have, a, I now, right at this moment, I have requests for 1,200 masks, so I stopped making those phone calls. We need to work on the production end of things to meet the demand. And um, we do want to know from people in facilities and other frontline workers working in grocery stores and um, other essential businesses, the, you know, we want them to have these masks so they are also on our list for getting the masks. When we are ready to scale up, we're hoping to enlist the help of some production manufacturers um, who can help us you know, professionally make the masks. And then we could probably produce um, possibly like 2,000 a week. And so these are not medical quality masks, meaning they're not designed for medical workers, they're designed for civilians well the n95 they are not n95 masks they're not n95 quality masks so for a healthcare worker that is um, working with a covid patient this is not the mask that they would use but my understanding is that in the hospitals where they're being used they're being used on patients so you can put a mask on the patient and that's going to make the patient um, it's going to make the healthcare environment safer and um, I think we're more and more, we're starting to hear the CDC today 
say that they're going to relook at this recommendation. Should we all be wearing masks? So uh, this is this is a notch down, I would say, from that N95 N95 mask. And how can people obtain the kits? How are you recruiting volunteers? What should, where do people go? What's the public information on that? Um, up till now, I've been, uh, I've been kind of intaking the people who want to make masks, having a brief conversation with them and then sending them over to Lyric. Um, as of today, we're asking people to contact the um, Burlington Resource Center and let them know that they want to volunteer to sew, and then they'll they'll feed that information over to me. And is there somebody there they should talk to, or they could call anyone? Yeah, they can call anybody. Okay, and then folks would come to Lyric and pick up the kits, or they would use yeah. them for them? Yes, um, we can also arrange drop-off if they needed. We can kind of coordinate that. If some people, um, some people want to help, and they're really very homebound, um, because they just don't want to take any any risks going outside, and we can uh, we can drop a kit off for them. They can let it sit outside. You know, if they have a place, a safe place to let it sit outside for 24 hours and then take it in. We've also tried to be really careful. We didn't touch the fat when we first received the fabric. We didn't touch the fabric for more than 24 hours. Lyric then brought it in and um, they do their best to cut it all in a very safe environment and wear masks. So, um, but I think at each level, if we can try and, and protect ourselves, um, we're not hearing the fabric is really a, a transmitter of the virus, but at the same time, it never, never hurts to take extra precautions. So it sounds like you're looking for a thousand volunteers to do this a lot of people to turn out 20,000 masks is that right um yes probably not a thousand uh, probably less than a thousand volunteers but certainly we could use a few hundred volunteers um and we can also use the uh professional manufacturers got it all right so and so if you have a manu and you know people have these manufacturing businesses that aren't necessarily on our radar and I think we are in a phase of retooling businesses. So if you have a business that has sewing machines and you can help with this effort, we definitely need you. And if you have um, an industrial sewing machine at home or something that's uh, got a good motor on it, we definitely need you too. Awesome. All right, Joan. So we'll direct people to the Burlington Resource and Recovery Resources and Recovery Center. Correct. Okay. Thank you. That sounds great. Well, thank you for this organizing. Do you have any other messages for your constituents or the people of Burlington? Um, hang in there. Uh, you know, I think this is more of a marathon than a sprint and we all have to keep just encouraging each other. And uh, I have really enjoyed getting to know Zoom. We have our, our friend groups on Zoom and it makes you feel a little bit more in touch. Um, so thank you to Channel 17 because you're also one of those great resources that helps us all uh, still connect. And we are new, learning new ways, aren't we? New yes, technology. We I, wonder, I wonder what it's all going to look like when we come out of this. I know. It'll be fascinating. Well, keep in mind that Zoom does scrape your calls for personal information and resells it. So just be careful what you, you know, don't meet with your therapist on Zoom if you can avoid it. It's that not, is good to know. I is. did not know that. But what about all the all the cocktail party conversations I'm having with my friends? Well, look up look up Zoom and privacy, and you can see basically that they make their money by reselling content, like pretty much every online provider of content. So, do you have a recommendation? <laughs> I think. Well, I think there should be a statewide public switch network like a Vermont interactive TV that's adapted for this purpose. But that I think we have to build that for the next time that this happens. So we're, I think we have to work on a resilient connectivity network that's publicly available for education, work, government, telemedicine. And that's what we're doing. It's what we're doing in our spare time is working on that design. 
Well, you know, I actually had, a, I did a show on Channel 17, I think it was like 2009 when we had the previous pandemic scare with um, Wendy Davis and, uh, um, and Seth Lasker. And so we were talking about that. It's, it's odd to think, but we were talking about t pandemics on Channel 17 10 years ago. All right, well, look it up because it's in the files. It's in the file. <laughs> Yeah, we've Thank you, Lauren it. Glenn. Thank you, Joan, so much. We'll talk with you soon. Just get in touch with us anytime. Okay, take care. Bye. All right, bye-bye.